Fractured Kingdom, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book Four, written by A. R. Colbert, narrated by Jennifer Groberg. Part One, The Center of the Earth. Chapter One. The grass wasn't really blue in Kentucky. I mean, logically, I knew it wouldn't be, but it was always referred to as the bluegrass state. And I guess a small part of me thought the grass might be a slightly different shade. A blue-green, maybe? What are you thinking about? Tate asked, coming up to a stop. Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing at all. He grinned. You don't have to be nervous. I promise. I'll keep you safe. I began to tell him that I wasn't nervous at all, but figured I'd keep my ego intact better if I didn't reveal my ponderings on blue grass. Besides... We were about to leave the grass behind altogether. Devon had brought us to an empty, wooded part of western Kentucky, just outside of Mammoth Cave National Park. He didn't stay long because he had to get back to Millie, so it had just been Tate and I walking through the forest for the last ten minutes or so. He'd explained that the Mammoth Cave system was over 400 miles long, and apparently there was an entrance to Agartha at its depths. Seems kind of strange to put the entrance to an ancient hidden territory right in the middle of a tourist destination, I said. It's protected, but there are only a couple of humans brave enough to approach the entrance each year anyway. It's not exactly convenient. And you have to do this every time you want to go back to Agartha? Tate laughed. No way. Hardly anyone messes with the cave entrances anymore. We usually enter and exit through the poles. As in the North Pole, like where Santa lives? You're cute, he said, brushing a thumb across my cheek. But Santa stays far away from the poles. We've got a private airstrip up there and a facility that allows us entrance into the openings. Hang on. I stopped and put my hands on my hips. Do you really mean to tell me that there are giant holes at the poles of the earth that lead down into the middle complete with an airport, and humans haven't discovered them yet? No. Tate shook his head. The humans definitely know they're there. We've got a working arrangement with the leaders of some of the largest governments on the surface. They've agreed to help us keep it a secret. Why do you think you've never seen maps or satellite images of the poles, and no airlines fly over? We let them give very expensive tours a couple times per year to keep suspicions down, but only to a handful of people, and we always clear their memories of our presence before they leave. That's nuts. I never would have guessed. That's the point, he said, pushing some small branches out of the way to reveal a large crevice in the stone wall we'd just reached. After you. I hesitated for just a moment before stepping into the shadows. Tate was right behind me, and the golden glow of his aura seemed to intensify and light the way before us. It was a narrow passage that immediately wound away from the opening. It would have been pitch black in short time, if not for Tate's warm illumination. This is one of the secret openings to the cave system. There are many, but the bigger ones have all been taken over by mortals giving tours. They're all connected, though, right? Right. So, technically, someone could find Agartha from any of the entrances if they hiked long enough, but our guardians would never let them in. The passage opened up around a second bend into a cavernous chamber. Tate's aura was no match for the blackness that consumed the large space. We could only see a few feet in front of us now. His hand found mine, and any hint of fear I might have felt disappeared. It's not much farther, he said. We walked across the hard earth, and I did my best to ignore the sounds of scuttering I heard across the floor and the flapping of wings overhead. All powerful leaders of sinister groups like the Manticoreans barely registered on my radar, but bats? Bats were a different story. I bit down on a soft squeal and ducked as one of the nasty critters flew a little too close for comfort. Tate chuckled and pulled me along. The air changed as we walked farther into the cavern. It grew cool and damp, and it almost felt as though the cave was breathing. I thought you said we were almost... Shh! 
Tate stopped abruptly and froze himself to the spot. I stilled as well, straining my eyes to locate whatever it was that had given him pause. Listen. His whispered words tickled my ear. I held my breath, listening past the sounds of the cave critters and the distant drips of water falling from somewhere within its depths. I could barely make out the sound of rushing water, like a river, and secondary to that was a murmur of voices. Who is it? I asked. I don't know, but we should prepare for the worst, just in case. We moved ahead, more quietly now. Every so often we would pause and listen again. The voices grew louder as we went on, and as the chamber curved off to the right, the walls began to narrow. Up ahead, the sound of the rushing water now filled the damp air, and the soft white glow of two large flashlights shone on a cave wall at the opposite end. Our keeper hearing was much more sensitive than the humans's, and it was clear now that we were dealing with humans, but we didn't want to get careless with our approach. We moved to the edge of the chamber, still careful with soft steps and slow breathing to remain unnoticed by the people ahead. There were two of them, both men. One looked to be just slightly older than us, and the other could have been his father. They stood at the edge of an underground river, talking quietly back and forth. Their words became clear as we neared them. I can't see anything on the other side, Dad. Just a wall. Please don't do this. It's murky, but there's an opening there. I know it. I've spent the last ten years preparing for this moment. I squeezed Tate's hand, and he lowered his head so I could whisper in his ear. Do you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to get into Agartha. Is that the way? Tate looked ahead toward the flashlight's beam disappearing into the water of the river. Yep. A thrill of excitement danced through my chest. Agartha was underwater? Maybe this whole breaking into other territories business would be easier than I'd thought. A loud splash drew my attention back to the men, or man, rather, as the younger dropped his flashlight and yelled after his father, who had disappeared beneath the dark river's surface. A second later, he leaped into the rushing water as well. I didn't have a chance to think before my feet were moving. I flew across the hard earth faster than I knew I was capable of running, and the sound of Tate calling my name barely registered as I dove headfirst into the river. I instantly saw more clearly below the water's surface. My muscles came alive along with my senses, and it only took half a second to spot the younger man flailing in the murky water. He whipped his head back and forth, searching for the older man, but it was too dark for him to see his father. It wasn't too dark for me, though. Above ground, there was only a wall on the opposite side of the river, but here I could see a flat opening about four feet below the surface. The older man's kicking feet disappeared under the wall, while his son still waved his arms around blindly. I wrapped an arm around the younger man's waist and propelled us forward after his dad. The water looked much the same on the other side of the wall, and miraculously, the older man was still kicking. I watched as he confidently swam back up to the surface. His son thrashed and fought against my grip, but the water gave me strength I didn't have on land. Securing my grip around his torso, I swam up toward his father. The older man was pulling himself back onto dry ground when our heads broke through the surface. Get off me! The younger man squeezed a boot between us and shoved me hard in the stomach. It was enough to break my hold on him, but I wasn't injured. It would take much more than that to hurt me in the water. Who are you? The father turned back with a grin. It's one of them. One of the Nymphilim. The younger man looked like he'd been burned. He backed away from me, looking horrified, and quickly swam to the bank to rejoin his father. I'm not a Nephilim, I said. The older man simply nodded once in my direction, then helped his son onto the land. The cave on this side of the wall was still very dark, but there was light coming from somewhere, just enough to prevent us from feeling completely blind. I was about to climb out and ask the men what exactly they expected to find here when Tate came up from the water at my side. There's another one, the older man said. 
It's a wonder they haven't killed us yet. I told you, we're not... Tate put a hand on my back, stopping me from finishing my sentence. We won't kill you, he said simply. In fact, we'll even escort you to the entrance. What are you doing? I whispered as we waded through the water toward the underground riverbank. I don't want to drain any more power today. I may need it when we get back to Agartha. Besides, the guys at the entrance never get much action. I'll let them handle the mortals. They're not going to kill them, are they? I risked a glance up at the men. The younger watched me, pale-faced, and walking backward like I might infect him with some invisible disease. Probably not. The older man was smiling wide as we joined them. I knew it. I've been saying for years that your kind still existed. Tell me, is there really another sun at the center of the earth? Something like that. Tate tried to suppress a smile. We turned another corner and immediately saw the source of the light. Two guards stood against a flat stone wall about twenty yards away. They both glowed with the same golden hue as Tate, and as soon as we were all in their sights, they shot what looked like bolts of lightning from their palms. Chapter 2 The air sizzled with electricity. I should have been dead. We all should have died from a shock that large. But there was some kind of invisible barrier surrounding us and offering us protection. One of the Agarthian guards paled. Thaddeus, I'm so sorry. We were told to be on high alert in case of an attack. The second guard kept his palms extended forward until his partner elbowed him in the side. He squinted ahead as though he didn't quite believe what he saw. Tate dropped his hands to his sides. He'd been the one controlling the shield. I'm glad to see it, but there are no enemies here. What about her? The second guard gestured toward me. Suspicion tugged his brows together. What is she? I'm Atlantean-ish. The old human man gasped, and the noise seemed to remind the Agarthians that there were mortals in our presence. Atlantis is real, too? The old man laughed. Even if you kill me right here, I feel like my life is complete. Don't give them any ideas, the younger man said. Are the mortals with you, too? The second guard lifted his hands again, ready to fire that strange lightning once more at Tate's command. No, they just want to see the Nephilim, he winked. Got it. The guard frowned. Come on over, boys. The older man stepped forward, and his son grabbed at the back of his shirt. It's a trap. It's not a trap. The guard turned to face the stone wall, placing both hands on it. The wall seemed to shimmer before fading away to reveal a city bustling with life down below. It looked more like a screen playing a live video feed than a window, but there was no doubt that this place, whatever it was, was not from the world we knew. The older man's eyes grew wide with wonder. Entranced, he moved toward the wall. Even the sun couldn't deny the magnificence playing out before them. A city within a hollow earth. The older man shook his head in disbelief. It's incredible. But why? He turned to face the guard. Why are you so willing to show us your home? You won't remember it. The guard's voice had taken on a song-like quality. A hundred voices, high and low, all blended together into one strange and enchanting melody of words. You will watch for a moment longer before turning back to the river. You will swim to the other side, return to your lives on the surface, and forget you ever found the entrance to Agartha. You will tell your friends that the Nephilim are not real. You will laugh at anyone who claims the earth is hollow, and you will give up your search for other intelligent life forms. The old man nodded. Yes, I will. But it sure is beautiful right now, while I'm aware of it. That it is, Tate said, stepping forward. That it is. The mortal men turned away a moment later, just as the guards had instructed them to do through their glamour. With one final longing glance at the entrance to Agartha, 
they rounded the corner back to the river that would lead them away. That was the last we saw of them. Now, Tate said, turning back toward the guards, if you don't mind, I need to get to the palace. The first guard immediately obliged, scooting out of our way while the second kept a sharp eye on me. We stepped forward, but just before I reached the wall, the second guard, good old lightning hands, moved to block my access. I was hired for this position because of my natural ability to sense danger, he frowned. Call it intuition, call it a sixth sense, but it's telling me that this is a bad idea. Well, as your interim ruler, I can tell you that your sense is wrong this time. She's with me. The guard swallowed and gave a slight shake of his head. I just... The first guard elbowed him again. Watch yourself, Jasper. This is our king. Interim, King, lightning hands corrected. And like I said, this is a bad idea. I'll have to report it back to Osborne. I tensed at Osborne's name. Why would his opinion matter at all? And why did the thought frighten me as much as it did? I knew I could take him. I'd already proven that twice over. Give Osborne my regards, Tate grinned. But the gleam in his eye was anything but friendly. Jasper recognized it, too. He stepped silently to the side, allowing me to follow Tate toward the wall. Tate reached out, and the stone shimmered into a new image as his hand made contact with it. It was less shocking now than it had been in Atlantis. I suppose I was becoming used to the magical aspects of keeper life now. When he stepped through to the other side, I didn't hesitate to follow him into the new territory. There was no city— I didn't know what kind of image the guards had played for the mortal men earlier, but this wasn't it. We were still in a cave, not much different from the system of tunnels and caverns we'd just left. The only difference was that this one sloped down at an incline so steep I had to physically concentrate on keeping myself upright. A small, childlike part of my brain wanted to lay down and roll to the bottom the way I did down grassy hills back in Oklahoma when I was a kid only I couldn't see the bottom of this hill. Knowing the Agarthians, I'd probably roll right into the mouth of a dragon or something equally terrifying. Tate reached for my hand again, and I immediately felt a sense of calm. We were in this together. With him by my side, I could do anything, even slay whatever dragon may wait at the bottom of this hill. But, of course, there was no dragon— in fact, after just a few minutes of walking down through the steep sloping tunnel, an opening jutted off to our left. Tate led me into the darkness, back to level ground. The space was small enough again that his glow easily illuminated the path before us, and it was a hundred times easier to walk on the flat ground here. You're not really Nithilim, right? Tate laughed. No, not any more than you are. But we don't mind the mortals believing that. If that's what they need to call us to make sense of it all in their minds, then it's fine by us. And what they said about a hollow earth? Yeah, that part's true. We don't have another sun, of course. We'd all fry. But we do have a source of light down there at the core. Mostly, it's still a lot of tunnels and caves. But there is a surface in the middle where gravity shifts. And the city they show the mortals is our capital, Shambhala. The center of the earth, accessible only by the poles and a cave in Kentucky? I shook my head in disbelief. Oh, it's accessible in many different areas. You can enter through Brazil, the Himalayas, even under the Great Pyramid of Giza. Kentucky was just the most convenient to us. This time, it was my turn to laugh. I'd call him crazy if I wasn't seeing it firsthand for myself. So, this palace of yours, I'm guessing it's in Shambhala? Yep, it's about a seven-day hike from here. Lucky for you, we have portals built into the cave systems. He slid his hand across a dusty wall. And we're just about here. He glanced over his shoulder with a mischievous grin, then stepped through the stone wall. I took a deep breath, then walked through the wall behind him. Chapter 3 
The other side of the wall couldn't have been more opposite from the cave in appearance. I'd pictured the middle of the earth as looking very dark, maybe with a red glow. I'd expected damp, dank hulls and bats, lots of bats. Instead, I stepped upon the glistening white marble floors of a great hall of a palace. Tate's hands were in the air, calming the guards who surrounded us. Their eyes were all wide golden circles, glued to me. Hi, I squeaked. That's her. Movement from the left side of the room drew my attention to a guard, who was quickly making his way toward me. The other guards glanced around uncertainly, but Tate immediately jumped into action. He rounded on the guard, and I swore it looked like he grew a half a foot taller as he funneled his anger at the older man. Back down, Tate bellowed. The guard stopped in place, shooting daggers in my direction, but silently obeying his interim king's command. No one is to lay a hand on her. Everly Gordon is my guest, and she is to be treated with the utmost respect for as long as she chooses to remain in Agartha. Am I clear? Yes, your majesty, but Osborne... I don't care what Osborne said. Tate narrowed his eyes, daring another guard to speak against him. She is welcome here. We waited for several seconds more before Tate turned toward an attendant I hadn't previously noticed standing in the doorway. Please prepare the noble suite for Miss Gordon. I'd like Lindy to attend to her. Will you please let the others know as well? Yes, Your Majesty. The young attendant scurried away. He took my hand then. Would you like to wait in my rooms until yours are ready? Uh, sure. I hadn't quite gotten my wits about me again just yet, so I followed him without question. He led me out into a foyer with a winding staircase up to what I assumed were the guest suites. One floor past that was the royal residence. The whole palace was bright, with glossy white marble and glistening gold accents. Warm light filtered in through giant leaded windows, and I craned my neck to see its source. There was no sun here, but that definitely looked like sunlight illuminating an airy world outside, with lush greenery surrounding the bustling city of Shambhala. Are you sure we're in the middle of the earth? Positive, Tate said with a laugh. It's beautiful, isn't it? Gorgeous. We stopped to gaze out of a floor-to-ceiling window on the landing just in front of the royal residence. There were mountains and rivers and forests just beyond a city that was somehow futuristic in appearance while simultaneously looking like it was pulled from the pages of a fairy tale picture book. It's too bad we'll have to destroy it. What? I whipped around to face him, certain I'd misheard what he said. According to the legend surrounding the prophecy, it's your job to destroy the keepers. I assume that means our territories and all other aspects of our lives will also fall. He frowned, lost in thought as he looked over his city below. And it's probably for the best, if I'm being honest. Our people are too far gone. The main door to his residence swung open, and an older man dressed in a suit stepped out into the hall before I had a chance to ask anything more about what Tate said. Your Majesty. The man bowed unbelievably low. I thought his nose might have kissed the ground. I heard you were on your way. I've put in a request to have dinner sent up for you and your guest shortly. Thank you, Jacoby. We'll get cleaned up. Tate popped his elbow out for me to lace my arm through, then led me into the most luxurious living accommodations I'd ever seen. Tate's family residence put Millie's multi-million dollar Manhattan townhouse to shame. Every surface was marble or gold, and it looked like someone took a giant bedazzler and added real gemstones the size of my fists throughout the rooms like confetti. Yet somehow... Even though it was totally over the top, it didn't feel ostentatious. Or maybe I was just too blinded by my love for this man to realize how tacky it really was. No, not love, right? Or maybe it was. 
Maybe the universe was playing the cruelest kind of trick on me, making me fall in love with a man who could never be my soulmate, igniting my heart with a man who would quite literally be the death of me if I gave in to these emotions. You okay? Tate asked. He snapped his fingers, and a candle in the center of a small table for two sprung to life. Yeah, I'm fine. I wasn't about to share those thoughts with him. Not right now, anyway. Besides, I was pretty sure I'd just witnessed a miracle. Did you just make fire? He crinkled his nose and scratched the back of his head. Kind of. It's an enchantment they put on the palace here. It's supposed to bend to the whims of the ruler. And you're the ruler? I shook my head. That's still kind of hard for me to believe. You and me both. He moved over to a window beside the table, overlooking his kingdom again. I joined him there, rubbing gentle circles on his back. You keep asking if I'm doing all right, but how about you? How are you handling everything? So much had happened, I'd almost forgotten that his father was killed right in front of him just a few hours earlier, and his twin was missing, too. He gave a small shrug. I thought I'd be more upset. He was a terrible ruler and a worse father. But still, he was the only dad I had. You're probably still a little numb from the shock of it all, I suggested. No, I don't think that's it. It's like somewhere deep inside, I know this is right. This is how things are supposed to play out. He turned to me and took my hands in his. This is your destiny, and I think it might be mine, too. We stood there, looking into one another's eyes for a moment. It was definitely not the most appropriate time, but I couldn't resist the urge to lean in and kiss him again. I craved that feeling of unity our kiss had provided back in the hotel, and I wanted to see if we could replicate it. Our faces were merely an inch apart when he turned away. I ignored the flush that crept its way up my neck. Of course he turned away. That was the responsible thing to do. He was supposed to be mourning, not making out. The butler returned a few minutes later with the mouth-watering dinner prepared by the palace chefs. We enjoyed the meal alone, while Tate told me a little more about Agartha and its wonders. Would you like to explore it tomorrow? He asked once his plate was cleaned. I pushed my own empty plate to the side. I would definitely like to see the fire lake. Subtlety was never my strong suit. As amazing as Agartha sounded, I was here on a mission. I had a blade to retrieve and a prophecy to fulfill. We could tour the place afterward. But seeing Tate's features deflate gave me a change of heart. If it was true that the territory would be destroyed by my deliverance, then perhaps I should make some time to see it with him first. It seemed important to him, and that was good enough of a reason for me. But of course, I would love to see the rest of Shambhala first, if you're sure you have time for that. I have all the time in the world for you. His golden eyes glistened, and my heart flipped in response. He escorted me to my rooms after dinner, and I fought to give him the space he needed. I couldn't get enough of this man, the ruler of Agartha. He was a bit rough on the outside, but now that he'd let me into his heart, I never wanted to leave. We lingered for just a moment before saying goodnight, but I didn't try to kiss him again. No, not tonight. Instead, I would try to find a way for us to enjoy each other's company and kisses for the rest of eternity, just as soon as I fulfilled this prophecy. Chapter 4 A fit of giggles erupted from a small group of Agarthian children peering over the rail of the bridge we walked across. I paused for a moment, glancing at Tate to signal for him to stop. We'd escaped the palace without much fuss and walked the streets of Shambhala in the warm mid-morning sunlight, and getting out had ignited my curiosity for this city. There had been other children playing as well, all bright-eyed and happy, as they ran and rolled in the grass between tents in the marketplace. But this group on the bridge was distracted by something in the water below. 
What are you guys looking at? I asked, stepping up to the rail a little ways down from them. Watch this! A golden-eyed boy flashed me a mischievous grin as he pinched off a piece of bread from the loaf in his hand. Throw this in the water! He dropped the fluffy lump into my palm. Just anywhere down there? The girl next to him giggled again with anticipation, nodding. I tossed the bread down into the water, watching it send ripples outward. It only lasted for a moment, though, before an enormous, iridescent, hot pink fish rose from the depths of the river and took the bite in a single gulp. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was the size of a seal, but more closely resembled a goldfish covered in neon cotton candy. The children laughed uncontrollably. Tate did, too, as he reached over and tapped the underside of my chin to close my gaping mouth. What was that? That was a rosy bubble bass. That was not a bass like any I've ever seen. Then I'd say you've got a lot more to see in your life. Tate winked and pulled me along. Bye, Prince Tate, one of the little girls batted her lashes and waved goodbye until a boy I guessed was her brother stepped on her toes. It's King Thaddeus, he whispered angrily. The rest of the children all laughed some more. I had to admit, the Agarthian people were growing on me. We might have gotten off to a rough start, what with Tate hunting my soul and the girls on campus pinning me to walls. Oh, and Clayton Miles stalking me, of course. But it turned out most of the people here were delightful. And Tate was eager to show me all of the wonders Shambhala offered. There were shops and restaurants, musicians in the street, and artists painting on the corners. The Agarthians all seemed so happy and at ease. It left me wondering why Tate believed them to be too far gone. I couldn't imagine bringing any harm to this city. Many of the citizens stopped to greet Tate as we passed them. They dipped their chins with respect, referring to him as a rightful ruler of Agartha, their king. But as we walked deeper into the city, further from the palace, I began to see others who would avert their eyes, or even scowl as they saw us coming down the street. Tate didn't seem bothered by them, though I was certain he must have noticed. We approached a large park in the middle of the city, walking along an outer sidewalk for a moment, before crossing the street toward more shops on the other side. Tate gestured toward a lovely blue cottage with a perfectly manicured lawn and a sign overhead that read, Moonflower. He tugged my hand to follow him across the street, and though he may have been trying to shield me from seeing what lay ahead in the park, his plan failed. A quaint little park bench, one that would have looked warm and welcoming on any other day, was vandalized in fresh red paint, bright as the flowers planted beside it. Someone had hastily written, Bow to Titus, or bow to no one. Judging by the hard set of his jaw, Tate had seen it. But by the time we reached the little cottage, his muscles had relaxed, and his frown was replaced with that boyishly charming half-grin of his. Let me introduce you to Hattie. A small old woman threw her arms around Tate's waist when we stepped inside. She looked about 80 in human years, which meant she was probably pushing 900 in reality. Thaddeus, I was beginning to wonder if you'd forgotten how to get here. He knelt down to give the tiny old woman a hug. Impossible. A man can't forget chocolate like yours. He winked. Hattie, I'd like to introduce you to someone. This is Everly. The woman turned her gaze to me. Her eyes were a little milky, but the golden glow behind the glassy surface seemed to intensify for a moment as she took in my features. After a long minute, realization seemed to strike, and she clutched her hand to her chest, attempting to bow at the same time. Whoa, Hattie, that's not necessary. Tate put up a hand beside his mouth and whispered loudly so I could hear. She doesn't like it when people point out how special she is. I'm not. I couldn't even finish the sentence before Hattie was standing before me, tears in her eyes. The Deliverer. Her shaky voice was barely more than a whisper. 
You know about that? Tate asked with an incredulous grin. I know everything. Hattie whacked him gently on the arm and pulled him farther into her little shop. Now come, let's get this beautiful creature some chocolate. Tate waggled his brows at me as we followed Hattie to a counter in the back. The cottage was full of exotic Agarthian flowers I couldn't name, all wonderfully arranged into exquisite pieces. It was a rainbow of colors, all impossibly vivid, and the entire place smelled incredible. Other gifts lined the walls, but it wasn't until we reached the enclosed glass counter that I saw the chocolates. They were works of art. Some were glossy, some glittered, Others were shaped into mythical creatures. There were truffles and nuts and bars, all mixed in with the delicate sculptures as well. My mouth was watering before she even opened the door, but once the smell hit me, it took all my power not to gasp at the aroma. Did you really make all of these? Hattie nodded proudly. Pick anything you like. It's on the house today for my king, and my deliverer. She gave a small bow again before gesturing toward the open shelves. Thank you. I looked nervously toward a very excited Tate before examining the delicious treats more closely. It only took a second for my eyes to settle on the chocolate of my choice. It was an owl, sculpted from white chocolate and brushed with a glittering gold dust. He was perched on a dark chocolate branch complete with knots and twists, like that of an ancient tree. It was completely enchanting, and it reminded me of Al. Wise choice, Hattie winked. Go on, take a bite. It was so pretty I hated to ruin it, but it smelled so good I couldn't resist. I snapped off a small piece of the branch and moaned. Oh my goodness, this is the best thing that has ever touched my lips. I take offense to that. Tate quirked a brow, and Hattie cackled in the background. I think I have some flowers that need watering out back. I'm going to step out for a minute, she said with a knowing look. Tate glanced back at me with a twinkle in his eye once the door closed behind her. Some people say that Hattie's chocolates are magic. I've even heard some of the young girls bragging about how they use them to make poor, unsuspecting Agarthian boys fall in love with them. I took another bite of the heavenly treat. I can see why. He stepped toward me and wrapped his hand around the back of my neck, lifting my face to his. Slowly he leaned down, and the butterflies in my belly went wild at the realization of what was about to happen. Our last kiss had been magical, and it was only an experiment. Now that our feelings were out in the open, what kind of an effect would we get this time? Everly, I... I batted my lashes, waiting for him to hurry up and finish his thought, or else I might just cut him off with my lips. I... think you've got a little chocolate on your mouth. He swiped my bottom lip with his thumb and popped it into his mouth. Then he kissed my forehead and walked away. I was too stunned to speak for a second, sorting through the rush of adrenaline I had from his proximity and the hurt I felt from him choosing not to kiss me again. Was I mistaken? Was I the only one who felt the bond? There wasn't time to ask him. Hattie came running back through the doors, panting. You need to get out there, Thaddeus. There's a commotion across the street, and I think you are the only one who can stop it. Chapter 5 You should wait here. Any mirth from our exchange just moments before completely vanished from Tate's face. His golden eyes darkened, a storm brewing within them. Should? Maybe. But there is not a chance I'm leaving you to face whatever is out there alone. I strode confidently ahead, moving past him to grab the front door. Thank you, Hattie, I called out over my shoulder. It was a pleasure to meet you. Tate touched my arm before I could step out. Are you sure you don't want to stay and finish your chocolate? Things could get ugly out there. 
Agarthians can be a bit unpredictable. I'm sure. I remembered the red paint dripping down the bench out front, and I suspected whatever commotion Hattie referred to had something to do with Tate's new position. It seemed not everyone was happy to have him in charge. After you, I pulled open the wooden door and gestured for him to go out. The light outside was bright, though I still couldn't place where it was coming from, since there was no sun. I heard the shouting across the street before my eyes adjusted enough to make out the angry mob. Standing on the park bench was the guard who had reluctantly allowed my entrance into this underground world the day before, lightning hands. Beside him stood Osborne. As Agarthians, it is our duty to our territory and to the greater earth above to lead with the highest nobility. We need a king who understands the complicated inner workings of Agartha. We need a leader who has studied the political history of the keepers, one who can rule with the knowledge of our ancestors. And most importantly, we need a king who wants to lead. Aside from the true heir to the throne, there is no man who loves Agartha and its people more than this man. The guard gestured to Osborne. Until we can locate King Titus, we should insist that Osborne takes the role as interim leader. It should be up to the people of Agartha to choose who takes the reins of our territory, not some stuffy old council members behind closed doors at a conference we weren't even invited to attend. Tate clenched his teeth and made his way to the growing crowd in the park. I hurried to keep in step beside him. They didn't look dangerous, but they weren't exactly a cheerful group of kids at a carnival either. Tate was crashing their meeting, and he was the last person they wanted to see. Tate fixed his face into a cocky sneer, the kind of look he used to give me when he was still hunting my soul. He clapped slowly, loud enough to draw the attention of the bystanders back to him. Such a moving speech from this previous member of the Royal Guard. Did you have anything to add, Osborne? Murmurs filled the crowd as realization dawned on them that the guard had just lost his job. They shifted uncomfortably on their feet, suddenly worried about what other punishments Tate might bring upon them for being involved. But Tate's eyes were glued to one man only. Osborne sneered right back at him, with an arrogance only an Agarthian hunter could be capable of. Ah, Thaddeus, we were just talking about you. I heard. Well, since you're here, I suppose you should know our people have a slightly different idea for the future of Agartha than the members of the council did. I hate that Titus is still missing, and I can't just sit around anymore while he's still out there somewhere so I've agreed to lead the charge in finding him. But it seems a people may wish for me to lead more than just the manhunt. Given my track record of loyalty and dedication to the royal family, they've nominated me as the interim ruler. My blood boiled as Osborne spoke, but to Tate's credit, he didn't so much as flinch at Osborne's words. The men never broke eye contact. It was a mental game of chicken, and my money was on Tate. How very noble of you. Unfortunately, the laws don't work that way. I am the second-born son, and next in line for the throne. You abdicated the throne, Osborne shot back. I never had a throne to abdicate. Titus was primed to fulfill the role of king. I went on to carry out other work for the territory. Now that it's my turn to serve, I'm here at least until we find my brother. Osborne looked like he bit into the sourest lemon, his features twisted with disgust. I fear that may be a conflict of interest, seeing as you're the reason your brother is missing. He is not! The words flew from my mouth before I had time to think them through. Osborne had that effect on me. I was raging. Darkness crept in around the edges of my vision, and my inner Athena urged me to strike against him. Goodness knows he deserved it, but thankfully I had enough reason to know better than to attack him here in Agartha. You were there when Rasputin struck, I continued. You watched his men kill the king. 
Tate had nothing to do with it, and you know it. It was Rasputin and his Manticoreans who took Titus. Rasputin and your Manticoreans. Don't play dumb, girl. We all know you're working together. You're not like the rest of us, and you can't hide it any more. My fingers felt for Russell's small dagger I had hidden in the waistband of my pants as Osborne took two long strides toward me. His accusation thickened the air, making it difficult to breathe as every Agarthian eye turned toward me. The murmurs started again. They'd just noticed how different I was. Not Agarthian, but not quite Atlantean either. My white aura suddenly felt like a spotlight. Power heated up in my chest, pumping out from my heart through my limbs. I was filled with a charge, and I wouldn't be able to hold it in much longer. The moment Osborne laid a finger on me, the power would unleash, and I wasn't sure exactly what that would mean for everyone else standing nearby. I wasn't even sure if I'd be able to protect Tate. Touch her, and you die. Tate's warning was a low, feral growl and it wasn't an empty threat. Anyone who saw the look on his face knew that he'd snap the life out of Osborne or anyone else who dared to put a hand on me. I didn't need his protection, but seeing his fierce loyalty for me was a welcome change, and it was further confirmation that we were connected on a different level now. Soulmates or not, Tate was more than a friend. We were two pieces of the same puzzle. The men silently circled around one another for what seemed like forever. Eventually, the other Agarthians in the crowd began shuffling their feet, moving away from the rally turned staring contest. Come on, I said after another moment. Tate's bicep was tight under my hand as I gently pulled him away from Osborne. My inner warrior had decided Osborne wasn't a threat, for now, anyway and we had more important things to do than play Osborne's games. There was a blade waiting for me to retrieve it in a fiery lake somewhere around here. Tate turned toward me, his jaw instantly relaxing as he laid eyes on me. You're right. We should go. This guy isn't worth our time. He took my hand and we walked slowly back through the park toward the palace. I felt Osborne's eyes on our backs until we turned a corner out of sight. It was only then that I felt comfortable asking about the blade. I don't want to wait another day, Tate. We've got to get it as soon as possible. I'm sure that's not the last you'll hear from Osborne and his cronies. I want to be ready in case he makes another scene. Or worse. Tate ran a hand through his hair. It's more than just a handful of cronies. Half the nation wants Osborne on the throne. That was their goal all along. Even if Titus became king, it would be Osborne calling the shots. He's been trained right alongside my brother since the three of us could walk. So what? It's not his throne to take. And if only half of your people want him to lead them, then that leaves another half who want you. Besides, you've got the power of the Deliverer on your side, I winked. And after we get the blade, he really won't stand a chance against you. So what do you say? Should we go get it? I wish it was that easy. His throat bobbed. Let's wait until tomorrow at least, please. I really just want one perfect day with you. He didn't finish his thought, but he didn't have to. I knew what he was thinking. He wanted one perfect day together because he thought it might be our last. No one had ever survived an attempt to get the Fire Lake blade before. Maybe I was a fool for thinking I could be the first. Chapter 6 I stabbed the steak on my plate and dunked it in the yolk of an egg. Any other day I would have been thrilled to eat steak and eggs for breakfast. It was a kind of thing I'd always heard about, but never actually been able to afford for myself. But today, even the most delectable breakfast turned my stomach. I was a bundle of nerves— Tate and I had shared a lovely afternoon and evening touring Shambhala, but he retreated to his room early last night without so much as a kiss goodnight. I tossed and turned in my own suite for hours, thinking about the mission that lay ahead of me. Today was a day I was going to retrieve the Fire Lake blade. As far as anyone else was concerned, 
This was the last day of my life. Maybe that's why they prepared steak and eggs for me. It would have been a good last meal if I'd been able to eat it without getting nauseous. Tate didn't eat much either. We spoke a little about the blade over breakfast, but there wasn't much to discuss. It was a bit of a mystery. No one knew what it looked like or where exactly in the lake it was hidden. Other than some folklore passed down through the ages, we didn't have any solid evidence that it existed at all. Our plates had long been cleaned, and I swirled my spoon through my lukewarm coffee as I built up the courage to stand and move forward with my mission. When I looked up from my cup, Tate's golden eyes were trained on me, his emotion unreadable. We better get going, I said more to myself than to him. He gave a solemn nod. Standing, he led me silently back through the palace toward the great hall we'd entered on my first day in Agartha. After commanding a couple of guards to clear the room, Tate grabbed two water bottles resting for us on a small table beside a giant portrait of a knight. You can go first. He waved a hand toward the painting. I take it this is another portal? A small smile tugged at the corner of his mouth. I forget you're new to this. He took my hand into his. We can go together. I hadn't realized how badly I'd been craving his touch. This was the first time we'd made contact since the chaos in the park yesterday. My heart still pounded every time he was near, but I'd been so focused on giving him the space he needed to grieve for his father and overcome the challenges with Osborne that I'd forgotten how complete I felt when we were together. I hoped he still felt it too. The portrait shimmered as we touched it, and together we moved through the cool plain inside the frame and into a dank cave system on the other side. He immediately dropped my hand again, but I tried to shake it off, focusing on our surroundings instead. Are we back in Kentucky? No, though Kentucky doesn't sound half bad right now. This is still within Agartha. We're about halfway between our world and the surface. Entering through this portal covers us in a shield that will protect us from the heat at these depths. Otherwise, it would get pretty steamy. But it's not enough to shield me from the fire lake? Not even close. He frowned. Come on, I'll take you to it. The only sound in the dark cave tunnels was the crunch of our shoes on the gravelly floor. We walked silently for ten minutes or so before the cave began to brighten. Tate's golden glow was overpowered by a deep blue light. It was so faint at first that I thought I might have been imagining it, but it grew brighter and brighter as we moved ahead. The ground began to drop downhill as we neared the light, and though I knew it was coming, I still wasn't prepared for the sight that lay ahead once we finally cleared the hill. The fire lake was stunning. A small stone staircase led down to the expansive lake, and from where we stood, it looked like the most incredible crystal blue water. But it wasn't a real lake. It was an expanse of rolling blue flames. Take a sip of your water, Tate instructed as he did the same. You can't feel much of the heat because of the protective shield, but it will still burn you up. You need to stay hydrated. I was burning, but it wasn't from the gorgeous blue flames licking across the surface of the lake. It was something internal, a fire in my chest, white hot, urging me closer to the lake. It's here, I whispered. I can feel it. Tate wore a brave face, but it didn't conceal the worry in his eyes. He looked like he might ask me to turn around and go back home at any moment. But now that I was here and I could feel the power of the blade calling to me, there was no turning back. Tate must have known, because he didn't say a word. I moved down the stone steps, following an invisible string tugging me along. As I neared the shore of the lake, the heat began to break through my shield. I could feel the skin across my cheeks growing tight under the dry warmth. Everly, back up! You're on fire! I glanced down to find a flame dancing across the hem of my jeans. I brushed it off and took two steps back, turning in time to see warring emotions across Tate's face. The blade is in there, 
I'm going to have to go in. He shook his head silently, but didn't object. He thought I was going to die, and really, how could I survive it? I turned back to the lake, mesmerized by the motion of the fiery surface. It was almost choreographed. The way the flames moved reminded me of a ballet. I could even hear the music, ancient and full of emotion. It was a song of sorrow and a song of promise. The lyrics were enchanting, sung in a language I'd never before heard. I pulled my gaze away back to Tate. He couldn't hear it. No, this song was for me. An idea occurred to me then. Twisting off the plastic lid of my water bottle, I channeled all of my energy into the liquid, willing it to rise out of the bottle. The water responded, rising and growing as I urged it forward with my mind. If I could somehow overpower the flames with water, I could forge a pathway to the blade. It was my only reasonable option, the only way I could survive this insane mission. As I worked, I realized I was humming a tune of my own. It was different from the song of the blade, but complimentary somehow. Words formed on my tongue that I'd never before heard. It was the song of Atlantis, and it was something I knew in my soul, but not in my mind. Perhaps it was time for me to step out of my soul's way and let my ancient untapped knowledge get to work. The water continued to pour out of the bottle at an impossible rate, growing and multiplying until it formed a large flowing liquid wall. Once I was certain it was enough, I lowered my hands in a calming motion before me, laying the watery wall over the flames like a blanket to create a narrow pathway. I wasn't sure if I could extinguish them or if I would have to use the water as a vehicle to enter the lake like a highway over the scorching surface. Unfortunately for me, neither was true. The water met the flaming surface with a sizzle and steam. Then it was gone. No one knew how deep the fire lake was. There could have been miles of flames to cut through for all I knew, but my little water blanket wasn't even close to being strong enough to overcome the vast waves of heat emanating from the lake. I tried again to pull more water from the bottle, but the spot where power burned in my chest before was nearly empty now. I'd used it all up. Cursing, I threw the bottle into the lake and watched it instantly melt to nothing. It's okay, Ev. We'll do some more research and try a different approach another day. Tate's cheeks were flushed from the heat, but noticeably more relaxed. His whole stance had changed as relief flooded him. I wish I had felt some relief as well, but all I could focus on was my failure. There had to be a way to get in there. I could hear the song of the blade even now as I regretfully left it behind. With tensions running high in Agartha, Rossell unleashing terror on the keepers, and Rasputin's Manticoreans threatening the entire surface of the earth, there wasn't time to delay. If I couldn't get the blade, I at least had to find the next piece of the tablet while I was here. I wouldn't let my time in Agartha go to waste. And just maybe, the tablet would have the information I needed to retrieve the blade. All I knew was that there was definitely a connection between the blade and the prophecy. I could feel it as clearly as I felt my connection with Tate. I'll agree to try for the blade another day under one condition. What's that? Amusement flickered in Tate's golden eyes. I suspected the interim king of Agartha wasn't so used to little Atlantean girls calling the shots. I'd like to spend the rest of today searching for the Agarthian piece of the tablet. Know of any highly classified locations we might be able to explore? There might be a couple, but they're all back near the palace. There is nothing else here in the caves? Just the Hall of Souls. My heart skipped a beat. I knew I wasn't at risk anymore. But the thought of entering the place where fractured souls were left to die was chilling. I doubted the tablet would be there, but I couldn't deny my curiosity. Will you take me there? Chapter 7 
The Hall of Souls wasn't close to the Fire Lake at all. It was about halfway between the portal and the palace in Shambhala, but it turned out there were miles between the two. The cave system was never-ending, and my feet were aching by the time we arrived. While the Fire Lake was an intense blue, the Hall of Souls emanated a redder hue. It wasn't warm like a sunset, but haunting and almost cruel. This was how I'd always pictured Agartha before I arrived, and really, this was at the heart of what they did. It was the Agarthians' duty to extract all the fractured souls from the surface, and this was where the souls were kept. The hall was too large to be called a room. It reminded me more of the size of the convention center where my high school prom was held. Only instead of blue and green brocade carpet and gaudy chandeliers, we were surrounded by stone. It wasn't any less beautiful, though. The red-gold glow held an enchanting quality. Enchanting and terrifying. The air was cool and damp. Chill bumps dotted my arms. There was one main aisle down the center of the space, with rows and rows of wading pool-sized openings in the floor on either side. I paused near the entrance to peek inside one of the pools, these were the source of the glow, but instead of being filled with water, they were filled with a heavy mist, like a low-laying fog swirling at an indiscernible depth. We don't have to stay here, Tate's voice cut through the silence. There's nothing to search in here, it's just the pools. He said it so casually, like we were at a water park, but there was an inescapable weight in the air. These were souls, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, real people whose lives were taken from them. They weren't just pools. I swallowed the lump in my throat and moved deeper into the hall. The tablet can wait. I need to... What did I need to do? Pay my respects? I was dead center in the large room, turning in a small circle to examine the space from every angle. Tate stepped closer to me, presumably to move me along, but I wasn't finished yet. Kneeling down, I examined one of the pools more closely as I vaguely registered him stopping behind me. I don't know what I expected to see. Souls weren't visible. At least, I didn't think they were. Thinking back to the incident with the fractured attack on Abby's dad, I remembered Osborne extracting the con artist's soul through a silver box but I never saw inside. Was it full of this same swirling fog? Were these the souls? I tilted my head, examining the mist. How many fractured souls were in here now? The hall was massive, and each pool was large enough to hold hundreds of those little silver boxes. Certainly, some of them were evil, like Rasputin's Manticoreans. But how many of them were mistakenly taken? I could have been in one of these pools if my luck had played out differently. Warmth spread across the left side of my body as Tate dropped to his knees beside me. I looked up to see his eyes reflecting the emotion I fought inside. Perhaps he'd had the same thought. I'm glad to be on the outside of these pools right now, instead of swirling around inside with the others. A flicker of hurt pinched Tate's features. No, not hurt. Regret. I'm glad, too. If I had carried out those orders... He grimaced, unable to finish the thought. I'm so sorry, Ev. I didn't know. I turned back to the mist. How many others do you think were wrongfully taken? And do they know where they are right now? Do they know what happened? Tate stared thoughtfully into the mist for a long time. I was wondering if he planned to answer me at all when he finally spoke again. A few months ago, I would have said none of them were wrongfully taken. I honestly believed that every fractured soul belonged here. But I'm not so sure about anything anymore. It just doesn't seem right. They could be here for an eternity, just waiting. Waiting for another piece of themselves that might not even exist anymore. Maybe they aren't fractured at all. Maybe they're just different. I thought of Sean and Abby, 
and how they could never be together, or else they'd risk having fractured children. It wasn't fair. The keepers were amazing in many ways, but they really got it wrong when it came to managing relationships. What if it's all a lie, Tate? What if the fractured aren't inherently evil? They just don't know how to manage their powers because they've never had the opportunity to learn. All these lives... I swallowed and bit back the tears that had come unbidden to my eyes. This was making me much more emotional than I expected. All these lives could have been saved. Things could have turned out differently for them. I turned to find him staring at me. The air between us practically sizzled with the electricity of our bond, as though it grew more powerful with the weight of our emotion. What if things could turn out differently for us, too? If the laws around the fractured were a lie, how could we be sure the curse between lovers of different keeper races wasn't a lie as well? This bond between us couldn't be imagined. It was as real as the air we breathed, and I couldn't believe that the universe would be so cruel as to make us soulmates, only to kill us with some keeper curse because we fell in love. Love. There was that word again. And as I stared into those warm, glowing golden eyes, I knew it was true. I knew it in the marrow of my bones. Tate's gaze dipped down to my lips, and before I knew it, I was leaning into him, welcoming his kiss. My eyes closed, and I held my breath in anticipation. But when his lips came, they met me with the chaste peck on the forehead before I immediately grew cold. Opening my eyes, I found him standing in the next row over. He must have run away from me as fast as he could. Have I done something? I asked, incredulous. It wasn't like me to be so bold, but I knew I wasn't imagining this connection. He'd admitted as much. Because I thought there was something special between us. When we kissed at the convention... I shook my head, unable to put that feeling into words. But now, now, it's like you're afraid to come close to me at all. What is it? What happened? Tate squeezed his eyes shut, hands balled into fists at his sides. I'd upset him somehow. My cheeks warmed with embarrassment. I was such a fool. This wasn't love. Not for him, anyway. I remembered back to the conversation I had with Rasputin about how Tate was using me for my power. I couldn't have believed it was true at the time. I still couldn't believe it. But why else would he be so hot and cold? Why would he pretend to be crazy about me one minute and then refuse to show me any kind of affection the next? With a deep breath, I steadied my chaotic emotions and made for the exit. This hall was full enough— I didn't need to add a fractured heart to the mix as well. Tate stood between me and the cave beyond, but I put as much space between us as possible as I stormed ahead. His grasp on my arm caught me off guard. I spun in place, but before I could speak, Tate's mouth covered mine. I leaned into him, not of my own control, but under the orders of some ancient need that had been awoken. My fingers twisted into his hair as he pulled me even closer with a hand curving around my waist. I was his. He was mine. There would be no separating us now. The kiss lit a fire in me, white hot. It started in my chest and worked its way through each of my limbs until my entire body was aflame. But it still wasn't enough. It could never be enough. I don't know how long it lasted, but all too soon, Tate pulled away, leaving me breathless and panting in my place. That, he said on shaky legs, is why I've tried to keep some distance between us. This thing between us, whatever it is, is too much for me. I'm not strong enough to resist it, and I know once I start, I won't be able to stop. I nodded understanding and agreeing with every sentiment. You're too important, Everly. His grin and the way his gaze raked over me left my belly in a knot. As badly as I want you, I can't get you killed. Save the world first. Deliver us. 
then we can really ignite this bond. Screw the consequences. Even if the curse kills us, I can't think of a better way to go. Chapter 8 I was so cold. I tossed and turned, rubbing my arms to bring some warmth back into my flesh. But it was no use. Wrenching open my eyes, I realized I wasn't in my bed anymore. I was floating, rolling in the waves. But this wasn't water. It was too cold to be water, and I was drowning. Impossible for an Atlantean. Shivers racked my body as I searched for the surface. I needed oxygen. I couldn't breathe. My legs thrashed and kicked, but I couldn't move. I couldn't swim. It was only then that I realized I wasn't alone. I was surrounded by hundreds of other beings, non-corporeal, all fighting to find a surface that didn't exist, all drowning in our own sorrows. They couldn't speak, but I knew who they were. The fractured. Together we clung to the faintest wisp of life in the Hall of Souls. I wasn't fractured. What was I doing here? What were any of us doing here? I fought against the cold some more, refusing to let it drag me down. If I allowed it to take me to the dregs of the bottom, I was certain there would be no coming back. The others fought alongside me, each of us engaged in our own private war. We would not succumb. Something sparked in my chest at thought of a battle. Athena. I had the strength of a warrior goddess brewing inside me. I leaned into the spark, fanning it into that now familiar white-hot flame. It melted through the cold, providing me strength as it extended from my chest to my shoulders, down through my arms and legs. I was stronger than the cold. I would not succumb. The white heat fully engulfed me now in the protective shield of its flames. I was invincible. A yell escaped my raw throat, burning as it erupted and shaking the hall to its core. With one final surge of strength, I thrust myself up, 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 until my face broke through the surface of the pool. I gasped for air, sweaty and tangled in my sheets. A dream. It was only a dream. I repeated the words out loud, rubbing my temples and willing my heart to stop racing but a hint of heat remained in my chest, tugging me from my bed. I stood, sliding my feet into slippers, and my hand found its way to the doorknob before I had a chance to consider what I was doing. My body gave me no choice in the matter. I had to find Tate. I knew the way to his rooms. In fact, after an afternoon of searching for the missing piece of the tablet, I knew my way around the palace and the inner part of Shambhala, far better than I'd ever expected. But there had to be more to it. After all, we still hadn't gotten any closer to the tablet. What other secrets did Agartha hold? There were no guards outside of Tate's suite. They were either remarkably trusting of everyone in the palace, including me, or they didn't actually care much about Tate's welfare. My money was on the ladder, especially after seeing the crowds following Osborne in the park. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Osborne had somehow paid them to leave Tate unattended. My blood was beginning to boil again as I silently pulled open the door. His sitting room was dark and quiet, no one in sight. My teeth ground together as I realized how alone he was in here. These people should be ashamed of themselves for leaving their interim king unprotected. Finally, I reached his room, and I was fully prepared to take up the position of guard outside of his door just as soon as I could confirm he was safe. But the moment I saw his still, sleeping face, all traces of anger completely dissipated. He looked like an angel. I wanted nothing more than to curl up beside him and snuggle his peaceful, sleeping form. But I didn't want to disturb him. In fact, I wasn't entirely sure why I was standing in his room at all. It had seemed like the right thing to do when I awoke from my nightmare, but now it just seemed childish. And yet, I couldn't pull myself away from him. I told myself I would just adjust the blanket to cover his bare shoulder, then be on my way. That was it. But it wasn't. 
I knelt down at his bedside, admiring the way his dark lashes fell across his cheek. I was fully aware of just how stalker-like my behavior was in that moment, but I didn't care. I loved this man, and I cherished every moment I was with him. The feeling was so strong I couldn't hold it in any longer. My voice was barely audible as I said the words aloud. Maybe we're soulmates, maybe we're not, but one thing is for sure. I love you, Thaddeus Castellanos. His eyes didn't so much as flutter. He was still passed out cold. But that didn't stop the world from shifting. First I noticed the light, pure, unfiltered, without a source. It filled the room, gently illuminating the space like the first rays of morning sunshine. Then I felt the warmth in my chest. Or maybe it was there all along, but it grew hot, hotter still, until I was reunited with that white-hot flame from my dream. And suddenly, I knew exactly what I had to do. With one final look at my love, I turned and silently left his rooms behind. I tiptoed down the stairs, finding my way back to the great hall on the first floor of the palace. Amazingly, there were still no guards, no attendants. It was as though we were the only two souls in the entire city. That was a good thing, because I couldn't imagine the guards would have been too thrilled with what I had planned next. With a final lung full of air, I stepped through the portrait of the night, ready to retrieve a blade of my own. Chapter 9 My friends were always jealous of my photographic memory. It was understandable. It definitely gave me a leg up when taking tests in high school, but it was never as useful as it was in this moment, navigating the cool caves of Agartha alone. Again, I swore I could feel the cave breathing. It inhaled and exhaled as I carefully plodded my way through its winding halls, reminding me that I was merely a visitor here. I tried to be respectful. I needed the cave on my side, just in case something grew angry with my next move. I was going to steal the Fire Lake blade. I didn't think of it as stealing, though. It was more like returning the blade to its rightful owner. The sword didn't belong to Everly Gordon necessarily, but somewhere in my history, I knew that it was mine, one of my incarnations, at some point in the distant past, owned that sword, and my soul was ready to take it back. I fought against the warmth in my chest as I neared the lake. My inner warrior was desperate to be freed, but it wasn't time. I needed her to stay put with my powers tamped down until the time was right. There wasn't an infinite supply, after all. I'd never felt this much strength in real life as I did in my dream when I set the warrior free in the Hall of Souls. I knew that if I did it again, she would protect me from the flames. I was betting my life on it. The blade song reached me before I saw the lake. I recognized the sad tune immediately, but it was more urgent now. The blade knew I meant business this time. I was coming to rescue it from its fiery prison. My steps picked up speed as I neared the flaming expanse of the fire lake. As I reached its shore, I began to peel back the restraints on my power. The warmth under my sternum exploded the instant I gave it space to do so. A heat that couldn't be explained spread through my shoulders and belly, down my arms and my legs, until the tip of each toe was bursting with enough energy to bring the whole cave down. I looked down at my skin, and for the first time I saw the white glow of my aura, I was lit from within, and instinct told me I was fully protected by the shield the white-hot flames provided only to me. Looking out over the lake, I uttered a single word. Stop. The flames obeyed as time jerked still. One step, then another. I kicked off my slippers before dipping a toe slowly into the blue flames and pulling it out for a quick examination. There was no pain, no redness. The heat had no effect on me. With the confidence of a general stepping into battle, I strode all the way into the lake. 
The bottom dropped quickly, and the flames consumed my body after only a few steps. Frozen in time, they more closely resembled a blue version of the northern lights, and I imagined myself the subject of a painting rather than a girl in a nightgown at the bottom of a flaming pit. The song was louder now, pleading for me to come. I stopped thinking, pushing all logic and reason from my mind, as I allowed the natural instinct of my soul to lead me to the blade. I walked for some time, never wavering as my power stayed strong. There was no guessing when I finally reached my destination. A large boulder sat at the bottom, at what I guessed was the center of the large lake. The top of the stone reached my shoulder, and it was as wide as a small car. The flames kept their distance from the stone, offering up a clearing, frozen in time around the boulder like a kaleidoscope of color. But the most striking detail was the gilded handle of a sword plunged deep into the rock all the way down to its hilt, the Fire Lake Blade. I paused only for a moment before reaching for the handle. It was surprisingly cool in my palm, and new tendrils of power from the blade danced their way up my arm, meeting my own white-hot power at its source beneath my sternum. Mine. One gentle tug was all it took to slide the sword from the rock. It slipped out as easily as a stick of a half-melted grape popsicle in the middle of an Oklahoma summer. But the power of this blade was far more delicious. The blade extended as long as my arm. There was a considerable weight to it, but holding it felt natural, and the power of the blade buzzed through my entire body now, entangled with my ancient untapped powers and leaving Athena quite pleased with her new possession. Blade in hand, there was one more thing I needed to do. I practically ran back up the steep slope of the lake bed, stopping short only when I noticed the dark figure of another person standing on the shore up top. Everly! Tate's tear-streaked face kicked time back into gear. Blue flames danced around me as I closed the distance between us, feeling much like a fiery siren emerging from her lair. Are you okay? Tate's eyes widened when he took in the giant sword in my hand, but his focus was entirely on me and my well-being. I had a dream. You were in my room, and... He ran a shaky hand through his hair. And I told you I love you. Power surged in my chest again at the words. Tate's throat bobbed, and he nodded. I knew you were coming here. I came to stop you, but I was too late. I reached the lake just in time to watch you freeze the flames and step inside. Then you were gone. You watched me walk in? Yeah. I couldn't move after you stopped time. I wasn't even breathing, but somehow I still saw what happened. It's like my physical body was frozen, but my soul was with you. His face blurred as tears sprang to my eyes. With the blade held at my side, I wrapped my left hand behind Tate's neck and met his glistening gaze. I hope your soul will stay with me always. I love you, Tate. I love you, too. We kissed, a gentle thing full of relief and comfort, and as we stood in one another's arms, the invisible rope seemed to wrap itself around us, binding us permanently together. My soul is all yours, he whispered as he pulled away. And I knew it was true. My heart was ignited. More than that, it was engulfed in flames that fed into my power. We were stronger together with our souls entwined, and I knew without a doubt that everything the keepers had been taught about soulmates and fractured souls was wrong. I would deliver them the freedom they deserved. Stepping back into my fuzzy slippers, I took Tate's hand in mine. Come on, we need to go back to the Hall of Souls. Chapter 10 The walk seemed much shorter this time. Perhaps I was high in the rush of adrenaline after securing the blade. 
or maybe the blade's power combined with my own made me that much faster. I couldn't explain it, but as we reached the Hall of Souls, I knew without a doubt that we were doing the right thing. A soft white light still emanated from my skin, and Tate's golden glow seemed more prominent now as well. Whether it was the power of the sword or the power of our bond didn't matter. We were a force to be reckoned with. Thankfully, we didn't have to concern ourselves with any danger from these poor fractured souls. They'd swirled in the pools just as I remembered. It was just as I dreamed, and my heart cracked at the unspoken fear and turmoil they experienced. I wanted to save them. I wanted to free them. But how? My pulse thumped hard in the hand that gripped my sword. I closed my eyes, tuning out everything in the world aside from that steady pulse. There was another, beating in time with my own heartbeat. It wasn't Tate's. It wasn't even the blade. There was something else in the hull, and it called to me. Never opening my eyes, I followed the beat, entranced by its rhythm. Led by instinct, protected by my blade and backed by my soulmate, I feared nothing. I simply allowed my feet to do the walking. The beat of the pulse worked itself up into a crescendo, taking my heart right along with it. The anticipation was nearly killing me when suddenly the pounding stopped. My eyes snapped open, and I found myself standing beside an especially golden-tinted pool along the back wall of the hull. The souls here had worked themselves into a tizzy, swirling into a furious chaos. It was like they knew I was here. They knew what I was planning to do before even I knew it. Lifting the sword over my head with both hands, I plunged the blade deep into the depths of the pool. The mist parted, the soles splitting to opposite sides, and there on the stone bottom, about three feet from the top of the pool, lay a rough-edged corner of an ancient stone tablet. The tablet glowed with a blue light, its pulse keeping time with my own, inaudible but visual with flashes of light. I held out a hand, and the tablet lifted from the ground, flying into my grasp. The prophecy, Tate whispered from over my shoulder. It was here all along. There could be no better place in Agartha to hide it than in a pool of souls that would never be emptied. I sighed. Never emptied before now, anyway. The souls quivered at my words, but I knew it wasn't time. There wasn't anything I could do for them just yet, but I vowed in my heart to come back and make things right as soon as I was able to. The answer was just out of my grasp, but something told me the prophecy would piece everything together. We just had to decipher what it said. We need to find Driscoll. We turned toward the palace rather than backtracking to the portal. The tunnels were thick with the air of anticipation, and occasionally the ancient cave system seemed to groan and creak like a beast awakening. Still, we ran. Tate felt the sudden urgency as well. The tablet pushed us ahead, faster and faster. It needed to be reunited with the other pieces, and nothing would stand in its way. We were nearly back to the underground entrance to the palace when the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Tate, wait. Something is wrong. The blade warmed itself in my hand, preparing for battle. Tate and I backed up against each other, circling around to locate the potential threat we both could now feel. But as far as we could see, we were alone. What do you suggest? he asked in a low voice. We've got to keep moving. We'd only gone another twenty yards or so before the first wave of power rushed toward us. It ricocheted off of a bend in the wall, crackling over my skin as I threw out my arms to protect Tate. An invisible shield blocked the attack from reaching him, and the effects of the lightning power couldn't reach me either. The sword in my hand glowed bright, its steel full of the same white-hot power I felt coursing through my veins— it protected me. Footsteps crunched on the gravel around the corner as what sounded like three or four men came running toward us. The shock of seeing Tate and me still standing drew them up short once they cleared the corner. 
but it only took a moment for their surprise to morph into rage. It didn't work. Get him! A small team of Agarthian guards rushed us, some holding weapons and others blasting electric power toward us with the flick of their wrists. I slashed my sword in an arc through the air, and a gust of white-hot power sprayed out from its tip. The guards were thrown back against the cave walls, their breath forcefully expunged from their lungs as my hit made impact. They were alive, but they wouldn't move for a while. I'd made sure of that. Keep going! We've got to get out of here! I didn't know how many other guards would be sent after Tate, and I didn't want to find out. We needed to get back to the surface to find Driscoll. As soon as we knew what the prophecy said, these measly little Agarthian guards would mean nothing. Osborne's claim to the throne would be laughable, if there was a throne left to claim at all. We ran through the tunnels, stepping over the fallen guards until we finally reached the palace entrance. More men stood on the other side. The palace had been empty in the night, because apparently all the guards were preparing to stage a coup. Too bad they didn't see me coming. My sword sliced through the arm of a man who had just knocked an arrow directed at Tate. His bow fell to the floor with a clatter, and I ignored his cries of pain as he gripped the sticky sleeve where my deep cut had made its mark. "'Try that again, and I'll take off the whole arm,' I growled. The other guards stepped back then, some still ready to fight, but others recognizing me as a threat. None of them made another move to attack, though one emboldened by the group of men surrounding him raised a fist with a shout. "'We will not bow to you, Thaddeus. "'No one is asking you to. "'I'm simply stepping in until the time comes for you to bow to her.' Tate gestured toward me, dipping his chin in reverence. The move might have embarrassed me before, but now I was starting to believe he might be right. Like it or not, these men would be mine to deal with soon enough. All the keepers would be under me, if they were able to survive whatever I dealt them through the prophecy. The tablet buzzed in my hand at the thought, reminding me that we were on a mission that couldn't be sidetracked by some angry Agarthians. I'll die before I bow to that fractured trash, the loud-mouthed guard sneered in my direction. As you wish, Tate said, raising his hands. No, I held out an arm. Don't hurt him. We don't have time for this. We've got to keep moving. The guard snorted, feeling like he'd won. Poor little guard. He had no idea what was coming. Tate and I moved forward, but I paused just long enough to press my blade into the soft spot of the guard's neck. You're welcome for allowing you to live. Tell the others deliverance is coming. Oh, and give your buddy Osborne my regards. I'm sure I'll be seeing him again soon. A single drop of blood slid down the guard's neck from the small cut left by my sword. He pretended to scoff but I felt him tremble before I turned away. A renewed sense of purpose rushed through me as we ascended the stairs to the first floor of the palace. The tapestry portal leading back to the mortal world was just steps away. Soon we would find Driscoll, decipher another part of the prophecy, and change the world as we knew it. It was only a matter of time now. Deliverance was coming. Chapter 11 it will be a long hike in the mortal world, Tate said, as we stood in the great hall of the palace. The world was still dark through the windows, though I suspected the first light of morning would announce its arrival at any moment. Devon won't be waiting for us this time, so we'll have to walk until we find a lodge and can arrange transportation back to the city. We better get started, then. Did you want to change or grab a bag or anything first? I held up the tablet and the sword. I have everything I need. As long as you're by my side, I think we'll be fine. Tate grinned. I wouldn't have it any other way. The woven tapestry that took us back into the mortal world hung on the large wall to our left. An image of an old English garden was displayed in muted colors across the large wall hanging. Talk about false advertising. I remembered the cool cave where we'd left the caves in Kentucky with a shiver. They weren't half as welcoming as that garden would be, 
but at least I'd get to go back in the water of the underground river. Remember, there will probably be guards positioned on the other side of the portal. I honestly don't know how many have been charmed by Osborne. I couldn't tell you if they will be friends or foes, but it would be best to expect the worst, just in case. I nodded, already having reached that conclusion myself. I'm good to go when you are. With my sword at the ready, I joined Tate's side. On a whispered count of three, we stepped through the invisible portal. The moment we reached the other side, we were immediately thrust against the wall. There was a carnival ride I used to love as a little girl. It resembled a spaceship, and we would all file in one by one, taking a spot around the inner perimeter. The ride would spin so fast that the centrifugal force would plaster our bodies to the wall against sliding cushions. We could turn ourselves upside down so that our feet were above our heads, but we wouldn't fall. That's exactly how I felt on the inside of the cave wall. But instead of laughing with joy and the thrill of the ride, I was fuming with rage and concern over my soulmate. Finally, a familiar voice droned. I was beginning to think he would never show up. I craned my neck enough to see Rossell and a small army of Olympians. The same short man who broke into Millie's house had his arms extended, holding me in place on the wall beside Tate and the two Agarthian guards who must have been on patrol when the Olympians arrived. The guards were asleep. At least I hoped they were just sleeping. Put us down, Rossell. There was fire in my command and fire in my palm as I maintained my grip on the sword. I plan to, but first I need you to agree to play nice with my men. He didn't look afraid, but the fact that he made any request at all told me he knew what kind of power I now yielded. Otherwise, he would have simply taken whatever he was after without any regard for me. Perhaps my attack at the warehouse made an impact on him after all. I considered freezing time, but in doing so, I would trap myself here against the wall. I needed the Olympian to release his hold on me. Then I could make my move. I'll play just as nicely as you do. I looked pointedly at Rossell, and he seemed to catch my drift. A flicker of fear dashed across his face, before he steepled his features into a look of apathetic confidence. You don't look like you're in a position to be bargaining, I'm afraid. So I'll make the offer again, and it will be the last time. You can agree to keep your hands off my men, and I will have them set you down. What if I don't? You don't have to. Tate's voice took on an unnatural song-like quality because these Olympians are going to set us gently back on the ground, and they will not use their powers on you again. Not today, not ever. I knew the effects of the sirens were weaker on other keepers than they were on the mortals, but Tate's boost in power from our bond made his glamour surprisingly effective. I had to actively hide my look of surprise as the Olympians wordlessly obeyed, lowering our feet to the ground. Wrapping my fingers around the handle of the sword, I had every intention of taking Rossell out right here, once and for all. But my traitorous arm wouldn't do as I wanted. Something inside held me back, and meeting Rossell's eyes, I knew there was more to the story, much more. May I see the blade? There was a childlike wonder to his words. Maybe I was a fool, but I didn't think he would pose a risk. Not with the blade, anyway. The handle of the sword pulsed in my hand in response, letting me know I was correct in my assumptions. The human part of my brain still didn't want him to have it, though. I don't think that's going to happen. He tilted his head, studying it more closely. It's remarkable. I never thought I'd see the Fire Lake blade in my lifetime. My heart raced as my chest began to heat up again. I looked at Tate to see if he felt it too, but I couldn't get a read on his expression. Rossell leaned forward to inspect the finer details engraved into the handle of the sword, and the strangest idea took hold in my brain. You know what? On second thought, 
Go ahead. Rosso lifted his black eyes to me with surprise. Really? I raised the sword toward him, laid across both of my palms like a peace offering. Be my guest. Everly, what are you doing? Tate asked, not even trying to hide his disapproval. The other Olympians all looked tense as well, none of us trusting the others. But the blade knew its owner. It wouldn't betray me. And if this was what I needed to get the information I still required out of Rossell, then so be it. I still believed he might be the only person who knew where my mom was. I couldn't kill him until I discovered what he knew, at least. We stood silently for a long minute as Rossell visibly warred with himself. Ultimately, his greed, or curiosity perhaps, won out. He lifted his hands and hesitantly reached out for the sword. I knew the second he made contact with the metal. I heard the sizzle in his fingers as his flesh began to melt from the incendiary blade. He cried out in pain, and the mob of Olympians who had followed him into the caves immediately rushed me. Everything happened so fast, I didn't even see who struck me or what they used to knock me out. All I knew was the fear on Tate's face one minute and darkness the next. Chapter 12 A cool hand and soft-spoken words stirred me awake. An icy compress was mashed against the back of my skull, but I was otherwise quite comfortable, propped up by a mountain of pillows and covered in a fuzzy, never-ending blanket. Millie? I squinted at the hazy outline of my aunt, willing the world to come back into focus. I moved to wrap my arms around her neck, thankful that I was still alive, but my right hand was weighed down with a death grip, still holding fast to the handle of the Fire Lake blade. I felt Tate next, a welcome tingle caressing my skin, just before he came into view. His lips pressed against my forehead, leeching the pain right out of me and leaving a tender warmth in its place. Are you okay? His fingers gently brushed a stray piece of hair from my face, distracting me from the pain and everything else other than his glittering gold irises. She's awake! Dom! Tate was shoved out of my view with a hard bump of Gala's hip. Her perky platinum bun wobbled atop her head as she clapped her hands. Dom! Get in here! Dom appeared next, looking happy to see me but there was definitely more trepidation in her gaze than there had been in the others. I'd learned long ago to trust Dom's instincts. What's going on? I croaked. I sat up and surveyed the room. We were in Millie's study, which had been pieced back together after the Olympian attack. I had no recollection of how we got here or how long I had been out. The last thing I remembered was... Rossell. His name escaped in a breathless growl. He stood nervously against a shelf in the far corner of the room. What were they thinking letting him in here? His people had nearly killed me. I lifted my sword. It was a struggle at first, but the warmth in my chest came easily now. I summoned it, gathering it up in my fist as I prepared to launch it from the sword and sizzle Rossell on the spot. Everly, wait! It was Tate who called out. It was a good thing, too. I don't know that anyone else's voice could have cut through to me. I paused, keeping the sword ready. It's okay. Tate joined me on the couch, resting a hand delicately on my shoulder. Rossell's on our side. Yeah, right. I lifted my weapon again, bringing it down only after a few seconds of Tate's hand relaxing the tension in my shoulder. It's true. Millie said. He was with Tate when Devon found you in that motel in Kentucky. He helped carry your body here. The Olympians weren't supposed to strike you, Tate added. His face reddened slightly and his jaw clenched. It's my fault. I prevented them from using their powers against you, so when they thought you were attacking Rossell, they resorted to physical force instead. As did you after she fell, Rossell said his words dripping with derision. Tate's chin dropped, 
and I wondered just how many of Rossell's Olympian guards fell at his hands. Maybe I should have felt some guilt, but all I knew was pride. My soulmate had stepped up to defend me the best way he knew how. I couldn't feel bad about him harming the very same people who almost threw Sean out of the window. They got what was coming to them. But as for Rossell... Just because you found him with Tate, it doesn't mean he's gone good. His men nearly killed me. Twice. Rossell has tried before, too. But I get my hands on the Fire Lake blade and he's suddenly reformed? Fat chance. Rossell moved forward then, a storm rolling in his black eyes. My chest heated in response, my muscles flexing under his attention. I won't try to defend my actions. I've made some grave errors, but time is running out, and I need you to come with me now. <sighs> I glanced around the room to see solemn looks on the faces of my friends and loved ones. They were buying his crap. I'm not going anywhere until I find Driscoll. I looked around again, hoping maybe I'd missed him in my first survey of the space, but he wasn't there. The tablet was, though. I saw its familiar blue glow pulsing from atop Millie's desk. Everly, honey, we have some bad news. My aunt lowered herself to a knee before me. Driscoll is missing. What? I stood, dropping the enormous blanket to the floor. What do you mean he's missing? Devon went to retrieve him from Port Amaris after he brought you three back here. But he's gone. No one knows what happened to him. Devon is still searching even now, investigating every possibility. Sean is doing the same here in the city. We'll find him. If he's still alive, Rossell added. I spun around to face him, sword extended again. What did you do to him? I know it was you. Is he banished to some island again, bound by one of your wicked curses? Rossell's shoulders fell. No, Driscoll is not the cursed one you should be concerned for right now. Who else have you cursed? My gaze swept the room again. Everyone looked slightly uncomfortable. Dom spoke next. I believe Rossell is cursed. I can't glean any information from his mind, and he becomes violently ill when he tries to speak about certain subjects. Certain subjects like what? The prophecy, Dom said. Then more quietly she added, And your mom? The source of my power squeezed tightly in my chest, burning up the sob that tried to escape. I knew it. I knew he was responsible for my mother's disappearance. And now he held the rest of the prophecy in his power as well. It looked like I only had one choice. Will you come with me to Olympus? He asked again, softly. I'll need the king's permission, right? Is Barius okay with it? Rossell's lips pinched together. We don't think you will require anyone's permission. Dom stepped forward and rested her hand on my shoulder. I've been doing some more thinking, and the braid of power mentioned in the prophecy may just be your ticket into any of the territories. A braid is made of three strands— and there are three keeper races. Right, I'm Atlantean, and I've definitely got a strong connection to Agartha. I met Tate's eyes with a soft smile. But I still don't have a connection to Olympus. Rossell turned away. Gala shrugged. We don't know that for sure, and you do have some unique powers. You've got a crazy glow, an Agarthian soulmate, and that sliver of brown in your eye makes me wonder if there might be a little Olympian magic in you somewhere, too. That seems like a stretch. Yeah, it does. But then there was also that vision I had of you walking through the Olympian gates. My eyes narrowed. You had another vision? Maybe you should have led with that. Everyone's attention was glued to me as they awaited my response. Even Rossell turned back to face me. I closed my eyes and inhaled deeply, 
deferring the decision to the ancient, wiser part of me deep inside. And the answer was clear. Should I pack a bag, I asked, or will the Olympians accept me as I am? This has been Fractured Kingdom, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book 4, Part 1.